Well, hello there and welcome to you wherever you're tuning in from around the world. My name is Nicholas Pegg and I'm the author of a book called The Complete David Bowie. And I'm delighted to be joined today by a very good friend of mine, a man who needs no introduction, but he's going to get one anyway. Um, musician, bass player, recorder player, a legendary record producer, and David Bowie's longest running collaborator, their body of work together spanning half a century. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to give a huge welcome to Tony Visconti. How are you, Tony? Hello, Nick. I'm fine. Thank it's great you. to see you. Thank you for joining us. Um, so we're calling this discussion uh, the stories behind the songs. And uh, over the course of our conversation, we're going to delve into every period of your work with David Bowie. But of course, we can't possibly hope to cover every single song. Um, there's, there's no way we could possibly do that. So perhaps we ought to just explain that what Tony and I've done is we've selected what we hope will be um, a nice representative interesting varied selection of tracks that we're going to concentrate on um some of tony's favorites some of my favorites too and some of them are going to be very familiar some of them maybe a little bit less so because we thought it might be make a change to take a few roads less traveled so um uh, so it's going to be hopefully a nice a nice mixture which we hope you'll enjoy so tony before we plunge into our list um let's go back and begin at the very beginning it's the summer of 1967 david bowie has just recently released his very first album produced uh, by mike vernon and um you have not long arrived in london yourself from new york and you've been working for the last few months on on various other things and you come together can you just tell us how you first met each other i arrived in london in april 1967 and uh, worked with my mentor denny cordell for several months on uh, people like uh, The Move, Prokel Haram. I was his assistant uh, producer. I was also his music, music arranger too. And um, he kept uh, grooming me and, and, and giving me so much, so many valuable lessons in the studio on how to work with people. And um, his partner in the production company was David Platts, who was David Bowie's publisher, music publisher. And um, I was brought into, I was called into David Platz's office and David Platz said to me, uh, I'd like to speak to you about an artist we have signed. He's, um, he's very different, he's kind of weird. And you seem to be a weird specialist because you worked with Mark Bolin and Tyrannosaurus Rex. So I, I wasn't in the country for maybe four months and I already had a reputation <laughs> <laughs> dealing with the weird artists, you know. So he played me several cuts from the DRAM album that you just mentioned. And uh, I thought he was terrific. I, I said, what a voice, what a writer. I said, he, he's never doing, he's never in the same genre twice with these three songs you played me. He's all over the place. And uh, David Platt says, well, we, we need somebody to focus him, to like nail him down to one so style that we could, you know, promote him with. And uh, he said, would you like to meet him? And I said, yeah, I would love to. He said, follow me. <laughs> so this was all a setup. Uh, David Bowie was in the next room in the, wow. uh, behind uh, David Platz's office and uh, opened the door, walked in, and, and I saw this real happy 20 year old guy with first thing i noticed was the eyes how could you not miss them you know two different colored eyes but he was grinning ear to ear because this was a setup and he knew he was going to meet me i i had no idea about this so we we kind of liked each other we were the same age we could see that we started speaking immediately about common interests which is basically mothers of invention frank zappa uh, I, the Fugs, there was an underground band, you know, anything rebellious, we both seemed to love, you know, and, and like. And uh, also we were, we had a common interest in Tibetan Buddhism that, that, that came up almost immediately. He wanted to put off, put across that he was a kind of a spiritual person. And uh, we spent the whole day together. We must have spent about an hour in that office speaking about all these things I just mentioned. And then we left uh, later that afternoon and just took a walk down Oxford Street. We ended up on King's Road and we saw a Roman Polanski film, A Knife in the Water. We both liked black and white films <laughs> from Europe. That was it. And uh, Roman Polanski's film was, you know, pretty cool to 
that was kind of our first date. You yeah. Know? <laughs> we ended up saying goodnight at 10 p.m. that evening. Wow. So it, it was a really wonderful first day, a great meeting, and uh, it was the beginning of a lifelong friendship. Yeah. What a wonderful way to, to start out. Um, so that, that's that's wonderful. Well, this brings us very, very neatly to, to what the first choice on our little list, because so the album, Bowie's first album came out in June. Um, I don't know exactly when it was that you first met, but I'm guessing it was July, August, something like that, because on the first day of September 1967, uh, we find you in AdVision Studios recording your very first two tracks together. So we thought we'd just talk about both of those together because these were the days when you could record two tracks in a, in a day uh, rather than take sort of several weeks over them. And the, uh, the tracks in question were Let Me Sleep Beside You and Karma Man, two lovely songs. Uh, your imprint on them, I think, is immediately obvious. You know, it, 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 they're a step on from what was on David's first album in terms of the production, in terms of the sort of lushness of the sound. So what do you remember about that, about that day and those two songs? Well, David and I said, we agreed that nothing on that first album was co commercial. He, he wanted a hit record. You know, he was dying to have a hit single. He was the right age. He had the right look. Everything was right, except the material. It was complicated. It was cerebral. It was all over the place. What, so what I uh, I followed David Platz's brief and I listened to David's selection of new songs, and I fe I felt the thing he did best was accompany himself on the twelve string guitar. He could sit there and hammer, you know, really strum pretty vigorously and make a good backing for himself, and and then his voice just soared over anything that he played. So that was the basis of Let Me Sleep Beside You and Karma Man. He was, that was the heart of the idea behind the production. And uh, for, for want of a better term, I would say I, we could safely call him a folk rock artist then, even though it wasn't folk music. But, you know, that, that term was applied to anyone who played an acoustic guitar and sang kind of. So we loosely did a kind of Cali California style folk rock backing like the Mamas and Papas would have had and all that. So we had a, like a sparse rhythm section. I know uh, John McLaughlin was mm -hmm. on, uh, on guitar. Uh, I forget who the, the drummer was, but all these um, musicians were booked via Danny Cordell, my mentor. He helped me because I didn't even know how to do that to assemble a studio full of session musicians. And he recommended them. So it might have been, I don't know who was on drums. Maybe you do, Nick. Uh, do you know, I've got, a, I've got a book just here. Uh, <laughs> that you wrote. <laughs> you know, I thought I'd better have a copy here, just in case these things came up, because I'm sure I've got it in here. Um, let's have a little look. Uh, you know, I wrote all this down in my book, so I didn't have to remember it anymore, uh, so, so that I could just look it up. But the drummer was, oh dear, now, where are we? Um, I could think of three. Talk about yourself. Here we go now. I guess, of course, you had um, uh, Big Jim Sullivan, of course, was also on this one. He was a sort of legendary session player. Um, uh, he was apparently there. But the drummer was Alan White, um, who was later with uh, Lennon's Plastic Ono Band. And um, Well, I take back that John McLaughlin. It was Jim Sullivan. Big no, no, John McLaughlin also. They, they oh, were, the two Yeah, yeah. You had the, you had oh, the, okay. Yeah. Because I had to go on Google last night. And, I, you know, yeah. you're asking me to remember back 53 oh, years. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, no, you, well, John McLaughlin and Big Jim Sullivan, uh, yeah, absolutely. Oh. But, but yeah, uh, there we go. So yeah, the drummer was Alan White. Um, it's a great, yeah, Big Jim Sullivan was a bit of a legendary session man, wasn't he? He had actually been on David's first album. He played a sitar on a uh, track called Join the Gang. And, um, but yeah, he, he sort of did the rounds a lot. Karma Man, that track, of course, you were mentioning your joint interest in Tibetan Buddhism at this period. That one is one of David's most sort of uh, openly uh buddhist numbers isn't it um yes yes he already told me he had met chimmy rinpoche the the tibetan lama and this song was written about him dedicated to him in fact and uh karma man you know it, it was very quirky and had the david always flirted with time signatures like he would be in a steady four four then he would put in a two four bar and then karma man if you could count them you'll find that you you get up to six on some of these right. beats, and then the, and so that was a, that was interesting to do. And I tried to make it a little Beatlesy with the uh, cellos. I had four cellists, mm. and uh, you could. I, I I I wrote that part. I wrote that same thing for "Let Me Sleep Beside You." It was the same exact lineup, the same cello players, 
the yeah. same instrumentalists. And uh, a very e eager David Bowie in the vocal booth, you know, he sang live on, on both those songs. And then we later, um, I think we were on four track tape then, you know, we had to, if we wanted to try a new vocal, we had to bounce it to another four track machine. It was very complicated to record in those days, much harder than it, than it is now, of course. And the Beatles did made that revolution by, before eight track was invented, you know, you had to bounce from four to four. And then sometimes a third, another bounce was required to get all these instruments, you know, get yeah. an orchestra and all these vo backing vocals. So the, there was mathematics involved and st strategy involved. Yeah. But David was so into the whole thing. He did what he was told to do at the time. It was meant to happen. And it was brilliant to work with this guy. He was like, you know, he's a couple of years younger than me. And he, he was already like a, a studio veteran anyway. Yeah. It must have been a very exciting time uh, in, in generally to to because the Beatles were kind of leading the way, but various other uh, artists. Were, it must have been a really exciting time to kind of get into the studio and work out how to do things that hadn't been done before, or work out how someone else had done something that you liked and kind of do something similar. Uh, uh, because there weren't any rules really, were there? I mean, you were you were making it up, and uh, you know you were kind of writing the rule book at the time with these things. Well, we we realized the Beatles were making it up all the time, and then just as soon as we got okay, we're going to use a cello, you know, because they used it on "I Am a Walrus." That yeah. they moved on to another instrument. They featured a harpsichord or something like that or she's leaving home or something like that and uh, so we realized that we had to get out of that shadow everyone was under the, the shadow of the Beatles in those days because oh. they were gods supreme you yeah know? yeah <laughs> absolutely so um we must move on because time is ticking on as so yeah. let's, uh, let's trip um a couple of years on it's 1969 now those tracks let me sleep beside you and karma man lovely though they were were rather maddeningly were never released at the time um david's record company at the time decca diram uh, were his his champions within the company had actually moved on and, and he wasn't having a great time with them and those tracks didn't actually surface until until a bit later but come 1969 Things are looking a little bit brighter and there's a sense, there's a growing sense that David is a coming man now. He's written uh, his track Space Oddity, which has uh, got a bit of attention. And he goes into the studio again uh, with you in the summer of 69 to start recording his second album. Um, we could talk all day just about that album, which is, you know, a real breakthrough moment. But the one we've decided to look at is the final track, Memory of a Free Festival. Um, this was recorded I think quite near the end of the session, it was around about September 69. And of course, it, it recalls an event that had happened a few weeks before in Beckenham. Um, I don't know, were you actually at the, the famous Free Festival yourself? Uh, the, well, I, I was at the Free Festival, yes. Yeah. So this is, this is, this is David sort of um, ending the album on a, on a sort of blast of optimism. There's a certain amount of um, cynicism about the hippie movement or at least the distance between its ideals and the reality on the album surfacing on songs like signet committee but memory of a free festival seems to me to be a very positive very beautifully sort of happy euphoric sort of song wonderful way to end the album oh he would he wrote about what he believed in he loved the communal life he loved be-ins love-ins and uh, you know he really took it on uh, very to, to heart that this was the future of of mankind that we were all going to get live in peace there's going to be no more war we're going to love each other you know and that, it was fantastic he meant every word he, he said in that song my feeling was that the studio version the album version was a, a bit on the shabby side it was not well thought out uh the session musicians i picked out weren't all that good you know although i love them dearly we we needed we should have stepped that up a bit, which I made good, you know, a few months later or a, half a year later when right. we thought we we had a single. We're still looking for that elusive single, and uh, we I think we had a single if we re-recorded it. And you know, by now we had Mick Ronson on the team, and that was that was a game changer right right there. The, those two his name Mick Ronson changed everything. So I'm, I, I made it up to David with that second version. I think that second version is terrific. Yeah, I agree with you. It's really, I mean, I love the album version, but I know what you mean. It has a naivety and a slightly plain uh, compared with the later single version. So yeah, uh, this was 
just on the cusp, just before you started working on the Man Who Sold the World album. We're talking yeah. March 1970 now. So, yeah, kind of six months later, you yeah. recorded this sort of, compared to the album version, it's got this wonderful sort of turbocharged. Of course, it's the, the, the band in the studio is essentially your band hype effectively isn't it it's mick ronson yeah yeah yourself and and uh um uh, john cambridge still on drums at that point i believe that that's right, right. Yeah. yeah he did a great job too uh, yeah and, and it's it, listening back to that single version of memory of a free festival you you suddenly see the future opening up for david's career don't you you hear that for the, it's the first real uh sort of it's exhibit a of the great mick ronson sound uh and of course you're you're the the way that you um you know, made his guitar sound in, on that track. It's just just remarkable. And he's playing this euph wonderful euphoric solo, goes goes up into the sky. Yeah, and yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it just sounds great. It, it's uh, it's kind of funny that, I mean, it's available. It's on various reissues of the Space Oddity album and it's out there to be, to be heard. But I think it's still, for some, a lot of people, it's still kind of eclipsed by the, uh, by the album version. But gosh, yes, I'd urge people to. Well, do you have a choice. <laughs> yeah, actually, well, how great that we've got two versions. And I... I, I a crazy kind of 1970 thing to happen is that the b-side was effectively just a continuation of the uh it was like the, the a-side is the vocal bit up to the beginning of the sun machine chorus and then they flip it over and you get the it, it carries on which is just a brilliant that's it's like a prog rock single isn't it almost yeah 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 it's just terrific stuff and i love that and then many many years later an artist called Dario G did a kind of uh, club single, which I believe you played some recorder on for him. We're talking about the 1990s now. Yes, he did. I was really surprised. And uh, I, I, I rose to the occasion. Yeah. I mean, it a great idea. It was one of the first any kinds of remixes I was involved with. It was, I like that version, but, yeah, but no, it was I, Sun Machine. I think he renamed it the Sun Machine. That's right. And used a sample of David singing the Sun Machine thing. But it, yeah, it kind of goes into this great big sort of housey, club mm. thing and, and yeah you play some terrific recorder on it so yeah that's a that's a nice people to find well so mentioned the man who sold the world album just a moment ago because you were just about to go into the studio with that just uh which, which indeed you did about, about a month after the recording of the second the single version of memory of a free festival um and i know the man who sold the world is an album that's always been very close to your heart um, and indeed to so many bowie fans what a wonderful album it is and again we could spend all day just talking about that but because it's um such a favorite we've we've actually greedily gone for a couple of tracks on the man who sold the world yeah uh, first of all a song that i just i always say when people ask me what you know this occasionally i get asked what's my favorite track what's my favorite album i, I always say oh i don't do favorites but if i did do favorites after all would be so high on my list of bowie tracks what an amazing track again it's almost got that kind of beatly you were doing a lot of experimentation on this yeah. album, weren't you? And uh, so would you like to just talk us through that? How did that start? Did it start as a David on his guitar type song or? Well, um, by then, you know, we were all living in Haddon Hall and uh, I heard the evolution of that song. I heard him writing it and getting it getting better and better. And um, it eventually became a band song. But I, my approach to it was I, I don't think I can trust everyone to just sit and wait to come in and all that so i i recommended that we just have david sit down and play the play the song through on acoustic guitar i, I knew his timing was impeccable and we didn't use a click track and his feel was great and then after he laid that down he didn't sing either because the leakage you know we would wouldn't be able to re record his voice if he sang and played at the same time yeah he was very disciplined he laid down the acoustic guitar track and then woody mick myself we started laying down our instruments and again we had even though we were now on an eight track machine there was still a lot of strategy involved because i had to ask everyone in the band what would you like to do and you know mick wanted to do two guitars uh, woody had some percussion ideas i wanted to do uh three basses because I wanted to bow one of them and play two different electric basses to get a haunting, a haunting sound, which I, I, that blows me away when I hear that, that bass, but a lot of work went into that. So after all, might have taken a whole day to record under those conditions and we, we hadn't even mixed it yet, you know, but, but it's, it's a charming song. It's such a, it's such a haunting song and, and and the message about i guess not losing your childhood and mm. being too serious and and uh, but then musically the, david always had great chord changes and as recently as uh, 
19, uh, recently 19, 2015, he said, he said to me, I write good chords, don't I? Yes. <laughs> said, yeah, you do. <laughs> he sure did. Oh, yeah. Sure did. yeah. And so anyway, that, that the chords, the melodies, the middle part, the key change. Oh, what, what a great, you know, and I'm not blowing my own horn because we were all involved. What a great production number yeah. that is. It really is. It's really, I love the, 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 the control of it. The, the, it's so, under, it's, you know, it, it, it's just beautiful. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm being uh, completely um, inarticulate because I love it so much. <laughs> um, another little feature on that, on that song, which is something that David obviously enjoyed playing with, is those sort of almost cartoony sort of goblin voices, the singing Oh by Jingo, the sort of high pitched and low pitched and things yeah. like Similar thing on all the Mad Men on the same album as well, and then later on, on the Beaulieu Brothers, he would do it again on, on the Hunky Dory album. Um, it's, there's a kind of um, almost a there's something quite it's 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 like a sinister sort of fairy tale, isn't it? I love that aspect of David's music, which is always there in his it's, it's sort of. Well, it, it's no uh, no mystery. He ha he has a lot of characters in his head. Yeah. <laughs> And, and he draws from people he's he's met. He's a, he was a great mime mimic rather. Yeah. He could he could someone would come in the room and within five minutes David was imitating that person's accent and vocal tone. He used to practice blatantly, like in the company of that person. You know, speak back to that person in his own voice. So, so he uh, you know, and we all knew he he eventually became a great actor. So all these talents would in their early stages, but he was using them to great effect, especially on uh, all the Mad Men and uh, using the child's voice. We had to speed up and slow down the tape sometimes yeah. to really get a big difference, but yeah. he, he could have done it anyway, you know? Yeah, yeah. I'd like to mention that as a band, we with the other great track was Save Your Machine. Obviously. Yeah, Save Your Machine was the other one we wanted to have, have a chat about, wasn't it? Which is, yeah, that is a great band number. And David vocally is giving a much more sort of bravura right out there sort of performance on it as well. But yeah, it's a terrific sure. band number. It's got a kind of a jazzy uh, inflection to it, hasn't it, that one? Well, by now, Woody Woodmansey was our drummer. And um, he was open to anything. He could. He was a hard rocker. I mean, he could really hit the drums until this day. He hits them as hard as you know hard can be. But I taught him a few things. I said, "This is. Uh, it's in six eighths time." I said, "Woody, I'd like you got to play this in a jazz waltz." And he never heard of a jazz waltz. And I said, it's, du -duck, du -duck, du -duck, du -duck, you know, like Dave Brubeck, take five. That's al almost that kind of a rhythm, except that's five, five, four. Yeah. But anyway, and and. I had no, it, we didn't have Google in those days. I couldn't like play him something on my phone. <laughs> sure. So I just sat with him in the studio and taught him the beat until he picked it up. So he hadn't even heard a sample of it. He just learned it from me. And um, he's also, there's, uh, I, I think if it's not this one, there's also a jazz bolero where it's dun, dun, da -ka dun, dun, da -ka dun, dun. You know, Woody learned all these things in the month before we recorded the album which is great kudos to him to, to do that. On Save Your Machine, you hear all these beautiful counter rhythms and it is like a jazz track. It's very jazzy. Yeah. But yeah, the band is absolutely firing on all cylinders. And yeah, David is 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 bellowing out this extraordinary sort of a histrionic vocal. I mean, it, it puts me in mind of stuff that you did way years later with him, stuff on, I don't know, on Heroes and stuff like that. He's really going for this kind of power vocal, which is, and, and it kind of, and you've got it, back in the mix so it's kind of soaring over the music and almost yeah. in the in the distance in the choruses you know and, and i think it's a it's a terrific number and um a fascinating lyric as well i mean it's another of his kind of science fiction parables isn't it about um about you know scary leaders about um yeah. taking life on on the wrong sort of leader hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> welcome to 2021 yeah okay. uh yeah, and, and, and the character is called President Joe, which is kind of, it's like Major Tom, isn't it? It has this <laughs> wonderful way with uh, with kind of um, character names. Again, it's almost eerie. Like, this President yeah. Joe business and saving, it's eerie. It is eerie, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, you mentioned, and, and, and Woody's um, kind of amazing accomplishments across this album. There's the, uh, maybe we should just very quickly mention his percussion on the title track as well. Uh, the, that that wonderful uh, now what do we call that little instrument? Is it a gyro? Is that right? Guir, guiro. <laughs> yeah, uh, which I, I believe I seem to remember you telling me once that Woody had never played that before either. He kind of picked that up on the day and learned how to do it. And um... yes, and because I played a lot of Latin American music when I was a teenager, uh, we had to play all these songs at weddings and all that. 
I learned all these instruments and, and I showed him the, the technique and he got it in five minutes. You know, yeah. it's a tricky instrument to play to get that scrape right, you know? Yeah. And it gives so much to the track, doesn't it? It just, again, it just brings it into a different sonic realm altogether. A stroke of genius. Yeah. Um, so at this point in the timeline, um, you and David had a bit of a sabbatical, didn't you? You were off being very busy with Mark Bolan, who was having huge success already by this stage, having big hits, which you were producing, um, songs like The Hot Love and, and Get It On and things. Um, and of course, the theme of this year's Dublin Bowie Festival, um, um, above all, is, is in fact the 50th anniversary of Hunky Dory, which we know is, is an album that you didn't actually work on because you were busy with Mark at the time. But I, I'm thinking, I'm just wondering, I mean, you must have heard it at the time, you know, and um, what were your thoughts when you first heard Hunky Dory? Was, did you think sort of, wow, or did- uh, No, know? no jealousy. When I heard it, <laughs> blew me away. It yeah. blew me away. I thought uh, songs that stuck out, stuck out for me were uh, Life on Mars, yeah. uh, Kooks, and Quicks. Mm -hmm. And they, I think they are all come in a row. Those those three come in the run, same running order. But what what I, I said, well, who who did this, you know? Um, and and it was Mick Ronson who I knew could he he asked me back on the first album, how, how do you how do you score like how do you set up a score? And I go, well, you put the violins down here, the viola here, the cello here. That's all. He just needed that one element. Now he, on, on this next album, he's right. He wrote that Life on Mars arrangement, which is yeah. just fantastic so uh, i think uh, hunky dory is actually one of my favorite albums <laughs> yeah it's terrific isn't it? that is quite remarkable those were by all accounts mick ronson's first ever string arrangements yeah on life on mars and quicksand and, and those tracks and and on yeah, uh, really, yeah. as well. and it's it's quite extraordinary and woody tells the story that mick was you know really nervous about it because obviously they had you know these proper grown-up classical musicians coming in and they and Mick was terrified that they were going to kind of turn their noses up at it but yeah, um, no. that, that's well, a great big fear <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's amazing amazing stuff so um after a few years you kind of reconnected with David in um well only a couple of years later towards the end I mean I know you'd, you'd met each other and, and got together again during the Ziggy period but it wasn't really until towards the end of the Diamond Dogs uh sessions that you kind of reconnected with david on a professional level uh, as david called you in to help him out with mixing the album and adding a few last bits and bobs and you, you mentioned your string arrangements earlier on on, on uh, let me sleep beside you in karma man uh, one of the things that you did for diamond dogs which i think is utterly thrilling thrills me every time is that fantastic string section on 1984 oh. uh, that was one of yours wasn't it and yeah, it, it, it um it interests me that you know that track on Diamond Dogs is clearly pointing the way. There's usually a track on any given Bowie album that is the shape of things to come next, isn't it? And that one really points the way towards the sort of funk and soul of what was coming next. Which leads me to say we're now in the summer of 1974. Diamond Dogs is out. David's in America touring the Diamond Dogs tour. And you're still based, of course, in London at this point. But you get the call, what, to catch the next plane to Philadelphia? Uh, exactly, what happened yeah. Yeah? Yes. So I flew to Philadelphia, really worn out. I, I forget what project I was working on back in London, but I was really tired. And uh, I, I arrived from the airport and made the mistake of going <laughs> straight to the studio. Uh, I really, what I needed was about 18 hours of sleep. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, I, I, that's the producer's chair. The engineer said to me, you're producing, you tell me what to do. And I said, okay, and the, the band had been rehearsing there and uh, there were already some nice sounds that the my engineer Carl uh, got uh, up on the board. It was, sound, the band was sounding good. And I, I just dived into the first song, which was Young Americans. I met Carlos, I knew already knew Mike Garson, but I met Carlos and Andy Newmark on drums. And uh, my favorite all time bass player, Willie Weeks was sitting there like I, I yeah, was, who was already a bit of a legend, wasn't he? I mean, he was... Dream uh, come true. If you listen to that live Donny Hathaway album, Woody plays the best bass solo in the history of bass playing. It's about a six-minute solo. It's, the song's called Everything is Everything. Right. You got that, So I, I was trying to learn that part. Yeah. As a bass player yourself, of course. Yeah. So a, bit of a bit of an idol. Well, that's one. So this was, of course, the Young Americans album we're talking about. Yeah. The, track that you worked on was the title track in uh, Philadelphia at Sigma Sound. But the sessions for this album, which were a, in, incredibly creative, incredibly prolific, you, you 
came out with a huge number of tracks just there at Sigma in that initial period. But David was still on tour uh, on and off. And then you got back together again in New York uh, a bit later in the year and did some more tracks. And in fact, the one from Young Americans that we've decided just to home in on and talk about a bit is I know it's a big fan favourite. And it's one that, uh, that David hardly ever performed live. He only performed a tiny handful of times right back then in 74. Uh, is the wonderful number Win, which I believe was actually completed in New York towards the end of the year rather than in the first Sigma sessions. Is that right? I'm, I'm not sure where we recorded the backing track, whether it was in the last day at Philly in Philly yeah. Sigma, or uh, I, I, we might have started from scratch in New York. I, I really can't remember, actually. Yeah. But uh, I remember one thing, one clear thing about it, apart from David's beautiful vocal, uh, which is a, kind of reminiscent of It's Gonna Be Me, another Another track that was like in a com completely personal, soulful vein. But with, with Wynn, uh, when we got uh, Dave Sanborn on sax for that, and um, this was a, a, a case of only having one track left and yet uh, the player wanted special effects. So I created this multi reverb with a, a few tape recorders. So David Sanborn was actually playing to that tape reverb in his headphones and that the sax sounds like like nothing i've ever heard before it sounds like it's out in the cosmos spinning in a, around like a, a planet's ring uh, saturn's rings <laughs> that's a beautiful description of it yes it's so it's ethereal and it sort of it it, it trills out of the speakers and flies off into the into the into the stratosphere doesn't it, it is the most beautiful beautiful piece that's incredible. so he had the reverb he, he was hearing the reverb as he was playing then and and it, well it was tape tape reverb tape yeah. back echo many many returns of, of different of different yeah. uh, gaps and it was recorded to tape so if i were to pull that master out right now you it's it's on tape all that he played to that effect and it was put recorded that way i believe you know a, a lot of uh, professionals uh, don't print effects i mean they don't you know my gosh you have to leave everything to the mix i never believe that Denny Cordell said, if you've got a cool sound, record it, you know, yeah. get, take it with you. You might be taking your tape to the other side of the world, but take that effect with you. Put it on the tape if it's that good. And don't, uh, and David Bowie had uh, a great saying. He says, you avoid the mire of options when you do that. So you, you commit it to tape and th then there's no point. You can't undo it. So yeah. you, so that, that sound kept, opens up a path that's ongoing you stay on the path of that sound see i don't think i don't throw special effects on a track for nothing no reason just so it's weird sounding it has to have it has to evoke an emotional feeling in you and david had the same idea about special effects it has to make you feel something it just just doesn't have to sound weird for the sake of being weird yeah yeah. And he was also, David, this seems to be a running theme throughout his, his work with you. I mean, he was very up for the accidental, you know, the happy accident, wasn't he? If something kind of curious happened, a bit of feedback or a bit of something, he, he his first instinct often was not to say, oh, dear, let's go back and do it again. It was to say, great, let's keep that in, um, which is... Exactly. That was his uh, little period of Zen Buddhism that served yeah. him well, you know. He, yeah. That had those happy accidents, all the beautiful Japanese calligraphy, those are kind of accidents, you know, and, and you wouldn't change a thing, you know. Yeah. So yeah, I, it was lovely. You know, not many artists work at that level. And uh, I'm grateful that he felt that way. Because I, if I heard something quirky, it makes you sit up, you know, and it, it kind of takes you out of the, the trance when you're listening to music. And that's a good thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, it's and the... a happy accident, usually. Yeah, absolutely. And in this great spirit of uh, experimentation, which which was always there with David, it doesn't come much more experimental than your next project together. And we're now just fast forwarding uh, another 18 months or so into the well, a couple of years. It's the summer of 1976. David has been on tour with Station to Station um, yeah, album, and uh, he's already made the film The Man Who Fell to Earth at this point. Uh, but yeah, he, so he calls you up again uh in the summer of 76 and asks you if you'd like to come with him to france to work on something with brian eno um and at this stage i think it's right in saying that david was concerned that his career was becoming a little predictable and he wanted to shake everything up again and do something unexpected um 
And I believe he asked you what you could bring to the table there. Yes, he said, this is going to be a totally experimental album. It might be a waste of your time. We might not get anything. No. He, was the other, uh, he was in Switzerland and Brian Eno was on the extension phone. And he said, um, what can you bring to the table? And I had this secret weapon. I, I was one of the, well, I think I was the only person at that time who bought an even tied harmonizer. Uh, which was, it's like standard equipment now, but then it was a brand new object and it was so expensive that no one bought it. But fortunately, my accountant said, you better spend some money this year or you'll you'll pay the queen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's how a lot of studio equipment is acquired. So I got this harmonizer and I went, I put it through its paces and I found that drum sound. I found all these weird sounds on my own. And I said, uh, I told them about it and they said, well, what does it do? And spontaneously i said it fucks with the fabric of time which it does it did and it still does <laughs> so uh, they whooped they both whooped i heard them holding the phone away and whooping quite <laughs> prolifically and uh, so i brought the harmonizer to france at the chateau de roville yeah the uh, the rest, they say, is history. And the rest, they say, is history, absolutely. Because, of course, this was the beginning of sessions on the album that would become low. Um, and the first of what is universally known as the Berlin Trilogy, although, of course, as we know, only the middle of those three albums, Heroes, which we'll come to in a bit, uh, was actually fully recorded in, in, in Berlin. Sound and, Vision, uh, uh, Sound and Vision, which we're going to talk about, along with the rest of the low album, was uh, recorded, at, as you say, at the Chateau de Revue, just outside Paris, um, so Sound and Vision is the one we've plumped for because, um, well, it's a great illustration of everything that you were doing on that, uh, on that album. Um, yeah, and it starts with these wonderful, these three drum beats, which you were mentioning that drum acoustic, that drum effect that you created with the harmonizer. Yeah. Can you just explain to us how, what exactly is happening there? Because it was revolutionary at the time, that strange buzzing sort of drum sound. How, how, how did that come about? Well, uh... When I actually introduced that, when I finally brought the harmonizer and, and I had Dennis Davis hit the drum several times so I could adjust it, they thought it was too strange. They said, this isn't going to fly. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, yes, it is. Wait till we get more music on the, you know, you hear it by yourself. Maybe it's not going to fly. But so I tucked it on. I recorded it always on track 24, you know, the the track that you really should only record things on as a last resort. I won't go into why, but that's what I did. And only Dennis Davis could hear it. And he understood immediately different volumes created a different effect. It was unpredictable how that pitch would drop. Like basically a dr it's a drop in pitch. It goes Doo, like that. But sometimes he could make it go Doo, like quick, a quick one, or he can make it go like that. He figured it out. So he was having a ball. He's playing drums and he's listening to it in his headphones. And every now and then they'd come in and I would just put the track up a little bit and David and Brian would turn and look around. I go, that's, that's it. That's the sound. And they started to get more used to it, you know. And of course, it made the final mix. But uh, Dennis was very, very clever. He he played it well. And yeah. Yeah, I mean, you were paying tribute to Woody just now, but yeah, Dennis Davis, who had uh, joined David um, uh, a couple of years earlier and had played on Station to Station um, and remained with David playing drums right up until Scary Monsters, uh, so several albums that you did together. He was a truly, truly remarkable musician, wasn't he? I mean, experimental and sort of this wit in the way he plays the drums, just extraordinary. Well, he had jazz training. You know, he never even played rock and roll. And uh, David was the first uh, rock musician he had ever met or even worked with. So uh, he got into it. I mean, it was like some, you know, rock and roll is just some basic beats that go back to R&B. And, but Dennis had a jazz feel. So if you listen to Sound and Vision, there's, a, there's always a little bit of a shuffle in his playing, which yeah. is like syncopation that's used in jazz. Very controlled and modified for rock music. Like Dennis was just very, very clever, you know. Yeah. He just knew how to fit in. Uh, I, George Murray, I think, had a jazz background, but he was more used to playing pop music. Sometimes he had a lot. He was a, uh, a session player who played pop and all that. And Carlos was from outer space. You know, he, <laughs> yeah, he was always on the cutting edge of guitar technology. It was it was just so wonderful how 
it's basically a live recording what you're hearing it's a live recording the overdubs were david's vocals and his lovely double track baritone saxophone yeah. which appears for just three seconds yeah i was going to mention that that's a, it's an extraordinary little addition because it's it's such a, i mean that's key to a lot of the low album isn't it but sound and vision perhaps is the classic example of it it's on one level there's a lot of electronica going on you've got the synthesizers and things but as you say there's also this fabulous sort of jazzy sensibility in 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 the in the rhythm section and then there's a david's wonderful saxophone it's, it's got a, it's actually a warm quite a funky sort of pop song but at the same time has this steely sort of um synthesize it you know it sounds like nothing that anyone had ever heard before about. and also along with dennis davis's drums brian Eno's playing this little on his uh, ems his little uh, briefcase synthesizer so you got you have brian Eno putting a, a, a beat every every bar on this yeah that little sort of fish that comes every now and then yeah. yeah 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 and like like david was a fond of like using whatever's available in the studio at the time and uh, my my wife Mary Hopkin was there in the studio, so she got like dragged in front of a microphone, and she and Brian sang the do 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 do, do which took all the five minutes. Yeah, and it's just it's such a hook on that record that do do really do. isn't it? And it, it I mean it's one of the longest intros of a of a famous pop single of all time, isn't it? I mean we hear oh, that really? we hear the do 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 before we even hear David, don't we? It, it, the um it's uh, it's an amazing an amazing track and i've just got to say it happens to be the first single that this little boy ever went out and bought with his own pocket money um Thank you so much uh and um i'd love to say that that means i was a child of great discretion and uh, great sort of taste from early on but i'm not sure what the next single i went and bought i think it might have been yes sir i can boogie by Bakura, but that's a, <laughs> not too bad is it that's a good single yeah. but yeah yeah sound and vision is is to me, one of one of David's many, actually, one of his many towering achievements, but it is a towering achievement. It's an extraordinary, it was a commercial pop single. It was a big hit, but it's also an uncompromising piece of art. And yeah. to be able to do both of those things in, in, in one fell swoop is is just just extraordinary. And that whole album is 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 like that. It's it's a, a just a remarkable achievement. And um quite hard on the heels of low you 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 know did another one didn't you i mean uh, in uh, the summer of 1977 so low has been out for maybe six months now um you reconvened with david and with brian eno and the same um backing band the same rhythm section it's actually we, we, there's so much more than a rhythm section that's that's <laughs> belittling them to call them that isn't it because they were just a wonderful band um so you're now at hansa studios by the berlin wall in in the middle of west berlin and um a second set of sessions in this in a similar experimental vein brings forth uh the album heroes which of course is another of david's great classics we love the title track so much it's one of his towering achievements but it's such a towering achievement that the rest of the album sometimes gets a bit overlooked i think so for on this occasion we thought uh Let's let's look at another track, and the one that we picked out, uh, which I know we both love, um, is "Blackout." Um, tell us a little bit about uh, about that track, Tony. Well, you know, when we worked at the Chateau, the Chateau is a very small studio and very dead, and it kind of made low. It gave low the sound it had because you know we would work within our limits and create magic from the limitations as well. But Hansa opened the scope like it was suddenly. Same drummer, same rhythm section, same singer, but there was this majestic quality to the whole album. Dennis Davis was on the stage, which normally in the old days of Hansa Studios held the choir. He, so he was on the choir roster. He was up there and uh, having a really great time <laughs> playing. Yeah. Playing the room again, like he would play a harmonizer, he would play the room, he'd know how hard to hit it. and. Uh, he also set up a, in, in his row of tom-toms, at the end of it, he set up a conga drum. So on some of these songs, he's playing drums and he hits the congas for like two beats in a bar. He sounds like two musicians. Yeah. So, and but in Cut and Black Out, you hear he goes, I think, get me to the doctor. And it goes, boom, boom, brrrkatum. And he ends up on the tom-tom as part of the, the end of Phil. So that's the giveaway that the tom-tom player is actually Dennis Davis. <laughs> So that was a terrific uh, addition, but but this is where David also used the room. He, you know, he's got one of the biggest voices in the world. Had you know, 
I, I know I couldn't even stand as close as four feet to him when, he's, when he was really singing full yeah. tilt in the voice he called Bowie histrionics. <laughs> yeah. So, so he was enthralled with the room and I put a microphone at the end of the room and one in the middle of the room just, just to, to record his voice. I got him on all three mics and he, would, he heard the effect on, on his headphones. He could, he could sing like in Heroes. He sang very quietly. And then when he belted, all three microphones would turn on at the same time. So he was using that for, for uh, Blackout as well. He's using that to great, great effect. Um, and, and also like, I don't know why, I'm just, just it, I'm not trying to say anything bad about him, but he was in a very decadent city as well. And he lived there now and he was a single man. And every vice that Berlin had to offer was available to him. So every now and then uh, we had to wait for the for him to recover from a blackout. I mean, right. no angel. I went to the same nightclubs, I got drunk too and you know, but but it was quite a decadent city and we made quite a decadent album there. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is an extraordinary, I mean, th there's a, it often feels to me that here is like pulling in two directions. There's a sort of, it's got that obviously heroic aspiration about it of, you know, let's, it, it, in some ways it feels like a sort of, let's get out there and, and take on the world and, 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 but on the other hand, yeah, some of the lyrics, certainly in this, in this song, they're quite dark, aren't they? I mean, it's a too great a price to drink rotting wine from my hands or something like that. What a line, what a yeah, line. Yeah. Um, great form. I love this album. I adore yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely fantastic. And yeah, there's, there's, um, a couple of live versions of, of Blackout. I mean, of course, on the um, the stage album, which came out back in the day, but also more recently, the um, live album from Earl's Court was released. And again, you can hear Dennis Davis playing those extraordinary drum parts yeah. live, you know, and it's it's breathtaking. It really is breathtaking. Um, and, and somewhere underneath all, all that on that track, there's actually quite a straight ahead rock and roll song, isn't there? I mean, it's got a sort of, fairly straightforward sort of rhythm riff or not unlike something like i don't know suffragette city or something like that but there's so much sort of ornate stuff going on on top of it that it becomes an entirely different beast yeah yes it, that's true but but it's it's well blended with some very strange things coming mm. from, uh, brian synthesizer yeah uh, uh, i think i can't remember who we use on a sean mays was or was it roy Roy Young on that album. Um, it's uh, it's uh, Sean. Uh, no, Sean Mays was uh, was on the tour. Um, oh. I, I, hmm, I recall him being in the studio too. I met him. You know, I did yeah. work. But but there were there were a lot of other musicians. Uh, some were playing the rock thing, and some were playing the the, the freaky thing. You know. Yeah. Sure. So it's got. But you're true. It's true. On underneath that, it's quite a quite a rock song underneath it. You know. Yeah. We Which I think part of its strength is just you know it's got a. It, barrels along and has this wonderful kind of muscularity yeah. to it but then it has also all this extraordinary kind of decorative strangeness about it i'm mean, just it's a, a masterpiece the heroes album is continues to thrill every time you just put the whole thing on from start to finish and uh yeah um it's 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 a wondrous thing um now sean mays i'll tell you when you work with sean mays of course because he did play keyboards on david's 1978 tour which was the tour that that was the backbone of it was based on the Low and Heroes albums. Yeah. Um, and then midway through that tour, uh, David went back into the studio, this time in Switzerland with you and with the tour band to lay down the backing tracks for the album that would become Lodger. So Sean Mays plays keyboards, of course, on, on that track. track. Yeah. And That's this is quite an interesting album, isn't it? Uh, um, in the making, because the backing tracks were laid down in Mountain Studios in Montreux in uh, September of 78. And then it wasn't until, again, about six months later in New York City at Record Plant that you got back together with David. And that's when most of the vocals were recorded and some of the overdubs. So there was a long kind of gap period. But the initial work was done at, uh, at Mountain. Um, yeah. Lodger has always been one of my favourite uh, Bowie albums. But yeah, it's it had a, a kind of slightly more protracted gestation period than the other two uh, in the trilogy. Well, after a, after uh, Hansa, when we got used to this big drum sound, we went to uh, Montreux thinking we could get the big concert room. You know, the, uh, the downstairs from the studio was a big concert hall. And mm -hmm. at the time we were recording it, all kinds of things were going on there, like a convention, uh, 
Queen used to use that room. That's why we we went to Montreux to, to have that big drum sound again, only the, the Swiss version of it. We never got to use that room. So the, the, the Montreux studio was a real small demo studio. I mean, Dennis was in a little corner of it. Everyone was on top of each other. It was uncomfortable. And uh, it was a strange place. It was really, it, it just didn't lend itself to rock and roll. It was very Swiss and that thing, very conservative place. Our uh, love, our tea boy was uh, Eugene Chapman. That made it wonderful. Every time Eugene Chapman walked in with a tray of tea, you couldn't help seeing Charlie Chaplin walking in with a tray of tea. <laughs> He even walked with his feet like like that, you know. He he didn't yeah. walk like we do. He walked like his dad did. <laughs> so that, that was light comic relief now and then. But he was a, a smashing guy. But we got it done. And then you know, when I got the tape back to uh, mix in another studio, it was like really dead, kind of going back to the chateau sound. It was dead. Mm -hmm. And uh, only until recently, when I, I remixed, I did a 2016 remix or something like that. Yeah. Uh, it, with David's approval, um, it, it did, was I able to put some ambience back into it and make it sound more lively, more 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 alive. But I do love the album. The material was incredible on it. Uh, Sons of a Silent Age, and uh, I think is on that, right? Oh, that one's from Heroes, actually. Heroes, but, okay. uh, but, but it has. Uh, I mean, Fantastic Voyage is a great favorite. Fantastic Voyage, yeah. 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 and uh, DJ, which is a uh, one of to me yeah. one of the great forgotten Bowie singles. What, a, what an amazing track it is! But yeah, the one that we thought we'd actually just just home in on a little bit and talk about is uh, another sing a single in America. Uh, uh, anyway, not in the UK, but the great track "Look Back in Anger," which yeah. uh, is another tour de force by that wonderful. Uh, three-man section of, of George Murray, Dennis Davis, and Carlos Alomar playing some fantastic guitar on that one. Yeah. Well, uh, Look Back in Anger is, uh, I think, a reappropriation of uh, John Osborne's play uh, for the title. I don't know if it bears any lyrically uh, subject matter, any, any resemblance to the play, but it's a, a title that didn't come out of thin air, is what I'm sure. saying. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wouldn't know that uh, actually how what the, the other any other relationship is to it, but the way that evolved, uh, it was a jam. You know, it was how to do it, and it, it, I think maybe we did, we did a, 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 an attempt the same tempo but playing in halftime. But Dennis just jazzed it up. He just started playing these complicated beats behind it and shuffling and like playing like an octopus and all that. <laughs> Carlos had a, a two amplifier thing going, so he could play a sharp sound coming out of one amp and a real spacey sound coming out of another amp. And his live take sounds like, you know, Dennis sounds like two drummers. Carlos always sounded like two guitarists. Yeah. So that was happening. Um, who else did we use on this? Uh, um, so that had, well, um, I think Brian Eno was playing some bits and bobs on there as well, uh, wasn't he? He was playing some... Um, uh, keyboards and uh, it's, it's looked like an anger the one where he's rather mysteriously credited with Eroica horn. I'm not quite sure what one of those is, but that's on the uh, that's in the album uh, uh, sleeve notes. Um, I but yeah, look like an, <laughs> yeah, I don't know what an Eroica horn is, something to do with Beethoven's third. I, I don't know, but uh, well, we can all go and find out, we can all go and look it up. Um, but uh, yeah, Look Back in Anger became uh, one of David's live staples. He he opened um, many, many shows with that number. It was it obviously became a real favorite. I think of all the tracks on, on Lodger, it's the one that he had the longest life afterwards in terms of a live number. Well, um, one thing I remember fondly is that David and I eventually did the backing vocals together. And the parts that goes, waiting so long, I've been, we, we sang that together. And it's a quite a long bit. If it starts in the middle of the song, it goes right to the, the very, very end of the song. For some strange reason, we, we were trying to get a tone in our voice. And we yeah. realized that we were imitating Lennon and McCartney by the end of it. You know, waiting. So, <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know. That we, it cracked us up and we heard it back. And we decided to go full tilt on it. So when we did our second overdub of that, we, we just went for it. And it's got a lovely tonal quality. And you might not know that that's what we were going for, but we said, oh, let's just do it. You know, let's just that go. That never occurred to me before. I'm going to go back and listen to it. That's, I can see exactly what, I can hear exactly what you're saying in my, in my, in my mind. It came, yeah. it came out like us anyway, which, you know, David's got an overriding quality. I'm the higher singer, but, but you can, David's voice really 
sharp. Yeah. 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 Excellent. You also, you provided quite a lot of backing vocals with David on your next album together as well, which gives us a little link to hop on um, to the, the masterpiece that is Scary Monsters and Super Creeps, uh, which again had a little gap between backing tracks and vocals, didn't it? You recorded with David the, uh, the backing tracks in New York at the Power Station early yeah. 1980, February, March 1980. And then a month or two later, you reconvened at your studios, Good Earth in London, uh, to record most of the vocals. Um, and yeah, you, you joined in with David on song, on tracks like uh, Up the Hill Backwards and Teenage Wildlife. You did quite a lot of um, yeah. vocals with David, didn't you? But the track or, or tracks that we've decided to uh, have a look at here, um, there's a wonderful kind of bookending uh, feel to this album because it begins and ends with two different versions of the same song, It's No Game. Um, it's a lovely device. It's a wonderful song and two very different versions, but they originate from the same essential backing track. Is that right? Yes. Uh, we recorded it once and once only. And uh, the harder version, the, the opening one, is the, the one we meant to record. And that was the, it was meant to go on the album only in that form. And um, uh, I don't know what to, what to say about it. What, what, it's just a fabulous opener to the album. And um, then we, uh, David wanted to sing it in Japanese. So we waited for a professor that he met on tour in Japan to write the Japanese lyrics. And he, for some reason, thought this would make a great Japanese single, which it did yeah. eventually anyway. <laughs> but so we ha hired this lovely uh, ac actress who was working in The King and I, uh, who just, you know, she, wa she wasn't from... Uh, Indonesia, she was Japanese, but you know, all yeah. the Asian ladies in London were in the, in that cast. And her name is, um, do you have a name? Uh, Mishi Hirota, I think. Yeah, Mishi right? Hirota, yeah. And she's, uh, another thing she did, she's one of the ladies on the cover of Sparks in the uh, album, Kimono My is House. Is she really? She's well, I didn't know. Women, yeah. So wow. she was in living in London for a long time. She got a lot of work, you know, and uh, so when, when she tried to sing it to the track, she heard the English melody, the English lyrics of the melody. She said, these words don't fit the music. And mm. David said, that's impossible. The guy's a brilliant translator. She says, yes, he translated it literally, uh, not, not musically. Like he gave right. you a literal translation of it. So it was way too long, you know. Mm -hmm. And he'd had, there are, I don't have them on tape, but he actually did try a few times to jam these lyrics in. So he listened to her accent and her saying it. And because she's a trained actress, he saw what was, what was going to come next. You know, I didn't see this. He said, why don't you do it? Speak it just the way you did to me. And she said, oh, you sure? He goes, yeah, go ahead, just speak it. You know, go up in front of the mic. So she did. And um, it was, she did it in like a, a very feminine, kind of almost a little girl voice. And he said, we're looking at each other. We go, this is weird, you know, David and I. I said, she can put a little oomph into it. He goes, I know what to tell her. So he put, pressed the talk back button. He says, can you say it like a samurai? <laughs> and she said, whoa, what do you mean, David son, you know? Because really, da 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 da, like Kurosawa, you know, and he's giving her all the. And she said, "Okay." <laughs> she just because she's an actress, you know. I think uh, another a person, a Japanese woman who wasn't an actress, would be a little uh, intimidated by that. But she got into the spirit immediately, and that that her her narration of it is just fantastic. We, we honestly, the step, the hair stood up on the on our arms it was just brilliant and it was eventually you know a, a big hit in japan it was yeah. because of her it's amazing isn't it i get another of those happy accidents in a way but it's it's it makes the track so special and so utterly unique and there's nothing else like it and what a way to open an album it's it's, it's just extraordinary um and also at the very beginning of the track there's a there's that little sort of tape spool sound. And then is it Dennis Davis counting in or who's, who's going one, two, three there? Okay, here's what, it's my 24-track uh, tape recorder, which I always thought every, every time I put a reel on and uh, the leader tape before you got to the oxide tape, I used to use paper tape because the paper would give the, the heads a gentle 
cleaning as, as before the oxide tape came on. But the mechanism, when I when press the button, it go click, 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 click. It sounded like something out of Metropolis. You know, it's like an old time mechanical sound. Yeah. And, and I set up a pair of stereo mics. I said to David, we got to get this on the album somehow. I'm just going to record it and keep it there. And he, lo he loved it. When I played it back, he says, oh, we'll, we'll find a use for that. And uh, so at the beginning of It's No Game, we decided to open the album with that and then cut directly into Dennis counting in It's No Game. I wanted to do a professional act with a crossfade, you know, so, but what you do is you actually hear a, a, a tape edit. So the, the, the machine stops abruptly and then you hear Dennis go one, two, three, four, and you actually hear the harmonizer on his sticks. You know, you hear the brr, 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 like that on his sticks. I never got my crossfade and I'll, I'll never do it. I mean, it worked perfectly. <laughs> and at the end of the album, at the end of It's No Game, part two, you hear the tape running out, if you listen closely. It's the same tape recorder, but this time it's at the end of the reel, not at the beginning of the reel. And it just right. runs out and it flutters to a stop, you know, until yeah. it slows down to a dead stop. So we got very creative with this mechanical sound and uh, yeah. it, it tops and tails the album. It's a wonderful way of coming in and out of the album, isn't it? It just, you know, it has that, it, it creates a, the idea of the whole album as this artifact that's been slotted into the machine and that start, starts up and, and winds down at the end. Uh, absolutely terrific, terrific. It's a, a stroke of genius as far as I'm concerned. And I guess the other thing we should just briefly mention on It's No Game, on the number one version, is uh, that wonderful guitar oh. by Robert Fr who had also worked, of course, on, on the Heroes album, but he, he's all over uh, the Scary Monsters album doing these amazing licks. And on It's No Game, quite an extraordinary noise he's making. Rip took about a day and a half to do all the guitar on that album. And I was just, you know, amazed at how he understood. He, he said, I know what it needs. And he'd come up with a sound. And David and I would look at each other and say, how did he get that? You know, I mean, he like he could read David's mind. It was just brilliant yeah. work. So that, that extraordinary kind of loopy noise that he's making at the end of part one of It's No Game, and eventually, and, and then we hear David shouting, shut up at him. Was that a kind of spontaneity thing as well? Was that after Fripp had played the guitar that David decided to do the shut up, or was it already an idea? Or No, we, we David decided to just throw, you know, he said, give me a track, and he yelled, shut up, and then we cut it and stopped it. Yeah. And actually make it go, Ugh. you know, I have yeah. to record this as, we actually stopped the tape and, and Fripp's guitar just went dramatically down in pitch. So we were up to all kinds of trickery on this album. And we always said that this, we always said at the beginning of every album, we're going to make our Sgt. Pepper album. Now yeah. this was it. We yeah. scary monsters. We pulled out all the stops. We would, we, we would stop at nothing. Uh, we, <laughs> we thought of it. It would go in. If we could think of the most far out thing, it would be on the record. And you know, Every track is full of surprises. Every track is different. It sounds like Sgt. Pepper or, or Revolver, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Quite... I hear new things on Scary Monster every time I listen to it, and goodness knows how many times that is. But every time I listen to it, I hear new stuff that I've never noticed before. And it, I think it's an album that sounds more and more avant-garde and futuristic with every passing year. It's still, it's right on the cutting edge, isn't it? It's timeless. Amazing. Timeless. Timeless. <laughs> Now, you mentioned a while ago that David's acting career was also, of course, you know, uh, an important part of his career. And it, it had been taking off big time by now. He'd, he'd done some movies and things. And in the summer of 1981, so about a year after Scary Monsters uh, was completed, uh, he appeared in the Bertolt Brecht play Baal for the BBC. And having recorded the actual production uh, for, for TV which he loved and enjoyed so much, he decided as a little kind of a memento for the, uh, of the project that he wanted to go into the studio and record the songs, which he had already sung in the play, but in the play, yeah. it's just a little banjo, isn't it? But he wanted to do a proper orchestrated uh, production of them, which led to your next collaboration after Scary Monsters, the, the, the wonderful music from Baal, which is a particular favourite project of mine. So I wanted to uh, stop and, and talk about that for a little bit. Uh, what do you remember about that? Well, it was an amazing experience because I, I loved Kurt Weill and Bertolt Brecht too. Uh, as a kid, I think we all heard Mac the Knife by Bobby mm -hmm. Darin on the radio, and that opened the door to that it's extreme collaborators. Uh, who worked apart as well but uh, the doing the music live 
uh, of Baal was a, a, a specific kind of writing which uh, Dominic Muldowney, the arranger, had really clear knowledge of. He worked in this genre before, and it was a Berlin music theater band that he wrote for. Uh, they, you know, in those like music halls where you go in and see a play and all that, they they had an orchestra pit, but only for about 12 players. You, you couldn't fit 35, 40 people in the, the smaller theaters. And there was a specific lineup that they had, like, which was basically one of everything. Instead of like two clarinets and three saxophones, it had one clarinet, one saxophone, one violin, one cello, uh, one banjo, one accordion, and et cetera. So Dominic yeah. knew this. And that, I'll tell you right away, that's very hard to write for that combination. It's all these different timbres. All these instruments have completely different harmonics and everything. But Dominic was a hero. He wrote these five five arrangements on the record, I believe, in, in record time. And we, uh, we did it in Hansa, where probably these early recordings were made anyway. You know, that Hansa goes back to the four, early 40s, I think, mm -hmm. in another form. Uh, I, I was told that uh, some propaganda music during World War II was recorded there as well. Hence the 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 the, the choir roster and the you could fit fit easily 110 musicians in in that room, you know. And there we were back in the, that old place doing that 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 great great music again. Yeah, well, you'd recorded Heroes, of course, and it was a for obvious reasons a perfect fit for the for the for the Baal uh, EP to go back to Hans. So it's the last it was David's last time and, and, and your last time with David there at, at, at uh, that, that legendary studio. Um, yeah, the, the track that I think gets the most attention that people, you know, they're all great, but the, the track that people particularly love, I think, is The Drowned Girl, which was chosen as a, a kind of a single. It was an EP, but that was the one for which a little video was shot. It's an extraordinary yeah vocal by David but yeah in the video this was your little moment in the spotlight was it not because you actually appear in that video yes and so does Coco Schwab yeah Coco Schwab you're you're playing the instruments with double David in the... yeah you're on the double bass yeah and Coco is on the classic guitar and uh I think Andy uh is there a saxophonist in it or I think there is they because they, of course on, in the same session you also shot the video for Wild is the Wind which was yeah. being released as single retrospectively and i think you swap instruments between yeah. between video and but yeah there's a i think there is a saxophone there and i forget whether it's in both of them or, or in the but yeah yeah well they were both uh, done in the same day with the director david mallet in my good earth studios down in soho oh it was in your good earth studios was it yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. oh wonderful and yeah so that that particular track has is has a has a great following i mean david's vocal is is almost unsurpassed it's quite dominic Maldani has spoken very eloquently about how extraordinary david's vocal is on, on all of this but on, on the drowned girl in particular but i just want to put in a word for another track which i adore which is remembering marie a or maria a i suppose if we're saying it in a german way but th that that vocal by david is is to me one of the most sublime things he ever did it's so it has well if i say it has a simplicity that's belying the fact that it's incredibly uh, you know, an incredibly accomplished piece of singing, but it has such an unadorned beauty to it. I, I find it incredibly moving. Well, I have to say that he did all those vocals in one day, and he, I did the three microphone technique that I used on on Heroes because he loved that. He loved the sound of his oh. voice in the room. He knew he could control it. And if you listen on a good pair of headphones, you will hear that that ambience. There's no added reverb. That ambience on his voice is the room again. You know, he's singing yeah. in a a room designed to be a concert hall. So he took full advantage of that. And we couldn't have done, like if Dominic just re recorded the uh, instruments with us and uh, he left, I would have never known, or David would have never known when he should come in, like to sing, to start singing. Because the, uh, the arrangements were so complicated, so beautiful. So Dominic stuck around and he would tell David, sing now, you know, he would point to him to sing. Because David was, learning the songs on the spot. He never really yeah. heard the arrangements until that day and right. you know, he would start singing. He did, it's true, he did sing them in Baal, but these were new arrangements. These were different sure. structures. Yeah, yeah. Wow, what a, I, I, I love that EP so much. And yeah, hey, boys and girls, go and listen to the Baal EP. You will be, you will knock your socks off. Um, yeah, absolutely wonderful stuff. And 
talking about the way in which the environment of a studio affected the way that all of you work, but certainly the way that David sang and the way, um, our next, we're, we're leaping way ahead in the years now because there was in this, at this point, a, a, you and David had a, a, a few years apart, but you got back together again to create some of the most remarkable work in the, in the, in the well, I say the last few years of his career, it was many years really, wasn't it? Because uh, we're, we're leaping to the album Heathen now, which was recorded in 2001, uh, came out in 2002. Um, and the track that we have decided to have a look at, another huge favourite of mine, um, became a huge live favourite as well, is the song Slip Away. Um, now, you were recording in a quite unusual studio for this album, weren't you? You were up in the, up in the mountains in upstate New York. Um, a very different sort of environment from the often kind of urban studios where you'd work with David. Yes, we were, were recording in a mansion uh, built like a little chateau. It was all stone, stone building. And this was the, we recorded in the old banquet hall, which had a fireplace that you could walk into. It was over eight feet tall. The, the, you know, there's a photo of David actually standing in the fireplace, practicing yeah. his baritone sax, because we eventually stuck microphones up the, the fireplace and got more, you know, beautiful, weird echoes. And it was, again, bringing back the feeling that, the, that we had in Berlin, where David could make another majestic work. It it does it, it did influence him. He could sing, and his voice would be sonorous, and it would it would it would be all over the place. And uh, he was also writing on the spot. Uh, all he wanted was a good drummer. Drummer, and I had previously worked with Matt Chamberlain, who is just a legend. You know, I won't go into his credentials now, but he was in famous Seattle bands, and you know, he was involved in that West Coast uh, rock from the '90s. And uh, what a mild-mannered, wonderful personality he had. And he just blended yeah. in. He was open to anything. Besides bringing his own drum kit, he had a, a bunch of Native American drums, you know, with tom-toms that Native Americans would play. He had them. He had a separate drum kit made up of, tom of Native American drums. Oh. And we had mics all over the place. So you hear all these textures coming off Matt, off Matt Chamberlain. And um, so Slip Away was something that I think Mark Platty recorded on Toy, but we, we eventually re-recorded it with Matt. That's and, right. Just the, 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 the Toy album, which had been recorded a year or so earlier in 2000 and ended up not coming out. But yeah, an, an early version of it was recorded on that. Yeah. So and an earlier they... version had, that earlier version had a recording of uh, Uncle Floyd uh, Vivino, who, who it was the radio show that David was channeling for this. It was a hilarious, I would say underground. It was a freaky radio show with strange characters. And uh, uh, I, I think Floyd Vivino has a brother, Jimmy Vivino, who's a famous musician as well, very musical family. I knew who, I knew who these people were, even though I was living in, uh, I don't know, I was back in America by then. No, I think I lived in America by then. Oh, yeah, I did. I think David said that he first hooked up to the Uncle Floyd show. He was introduced to it by John Lennon, uh, I believe, and oh, uh, I didn't know at some that. point in the, in the late seventies, and uh, and yeah, that he was well into it. In fact, went along to a recording at some point, apparently, uh, so, just to. It's the most beautiful tribute, and it very sounds very sentimental, very nostalgic. I mean, we were going for that, tugging the heartstrings. I had. Uh, it was during made during 9-11. We weren't feeling too good about that. And uh, we got some friends to drive up from Manhattan, some string players who bravely, I mean, you were, weren't even allowed to get in and out of the city in those days, but they, they took a chance and they all drove up in one car and they were called the Scorchio Quartet. And they played the lovely string quartet on there. And the top line that I wrote, the count, counter melody to the, the chorus, I said, you know, David, get, did you bring your stylophone with you? I said, because you, you can play that string part on the stylophone. So it's such that the stylophone's a nostalgic instrument, really. And David is, you could hear his stylophone soaring over the strings on that. I mean, it just seeps with nostalgia and, and he sings so soulfully. And I know Uncle Floyd heard it. He was really chuffed, you know. Yeah, he yeah. He loved it, apparently. And I, I love it's it's such a david bowie thing to do that that song obviously it has its specific references to the uncle floyd show and that's what it it takes as its subject matter but it kind of bursts out of that and becomes a song just of universal 
sort of yearning, doesn't it? And it doesn't, you don't have to get the references. It's still a beautiful song. You know, if you heard it and didn't know what he was on about, you would still yeah. get that feeling. Of, it's, it's an extraordinary thing. There are some very interesting um, sonic aspects to it, as well as the, the stylophone, as you mentioned, which, of course, David played way back on Space Oddity and, and on some of the tracks on Man Who Sold the World. There's also, um, I'm, I'm intrigued by that, uh, the way his vocal, the way his voice kind of comes in and out at the beginning, almost as though it's on the radio to start with, in a sort of crackly way, and then comes kind of full onto the microphone. That's obviously a, a deliberate decision. That's what we were doing. Yeah, we tried to tune him in on the radio, you know. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know exactly how I did it now. I'm, I'm sure I could analyze it, but uh, yeah, yeah, that we were going for it. Yeah, like you're listening yeah. to a radio show, and then, like you said, it morphs into something else, something bigger and something different. Yeah, such a beautiful song. And when David performed it subsequently on tour, in, on the Heathen and on the reality tours, it became a real crowd pleaser. Everyone was kind of waving and singing along to it. Absolutely. It was really moving, a really moving number. Yeah, I love that one. Um, and Matt Chamberlain, you mentioned, uh, the, the wonderful drummer on the Heathen album. Um, he didn't, I believe, actually work on your next album with David, Reality, but some drumming that he had done during the Heathen sessions on a track that ended up being an outtake from the album did make it onto the the next album reality was the album that you then recorded with david early 2003 and we're back in new york now at looking glass studios and the track that that i wanted to look at here because i think it's just one of the classics of of uh, well <laughs> of all of david's career actually but certainly from his later work is the closing number on the album bring me the disco king which had a long long gestation over the years um so how did you first become aware of this? I'm assuming David said we've tried this before and it's never quite worked. That's right. I wasn't familiar with the song and um, I thought it was a great song and it should go on the album. And uh, it was, we had left uh, the recording of backing tracks well behind us. We didn't have a drummer available, uh, no other musicians. It was just David and I working in the studio. <clears throat> so I said, there's one track and I, I don't actually remember what it was. It might've been, it's, I can tell you what it is, because it was actually released in the end, but only as a B-side. It's, it's a very beautiful song from the Heathen Sessions. Plan B. When the boys come marching home. Oh, when the boys come marching home, that's yeah. it. Yeah. And it that's came out as a B-side, and it's a lovely song in itself. But yeah, if you go and listen to that, and listen to Bring Me the Disco King, you will it. notice that it is indeed the same drum part. Although, of course, for Disco King, you kind of looped it and changed it. Uh, it changed yeah, it. we added a few extra bits to it, but it, the basic loop was from that song. You're absolutely right. Mm. And uh, we called Mike Garson in, who hadn't played with David for a while, and um, sat him on a, uh, a digital keyboard in Looking Glass Studio. And he just played the absolute perfect part to it, because, you know, it was meant to be sparse, meant to be kind of, I don't know, depressing a little bit, you know. Yeah. And he rose to the occasion. And we, we lived, you know, we had some good piano samples. I had uh, some Roland gear, which I still have. Roland always made great sounding digital pianos. You wouldn't, yeah. very hard to tell, especially with other instruments playing. You would say, oh, is that a real piano or not? And it always sound, they sounded great. And we used that. And uh, Mike said, well, this is just temporary sound. When I go back to California, I've got this Yamaha Grand, which I can hook up to MIDI and I'll send you back. I'll record it with eight microphones and I'll send you back all the microphones and all that. And it's too late. Now, you don't do that to David. <laughs> it was done. We loved it. We didn't want to change the sound. It was just done. And I'm afraid, you know, we didn't uh, do what Mike wished us to do. It, it did sound good, but it didn't have the sound that, that David sung it to. And it, it didn't have the mood. It did sound like a grand piano. And that wasn't the... The mood the proper sound to the song yeah yeah oh it, it's yeah it, again it's it's just one of those extraordinary it's exactly the right decision isn't it because it just sounds perfect it's got that slightly um oh i don't know it, it's evocative of of a, of a sort of smoky nightclub at two o'clock yeah. in the morning when everyone's left and someone's putting the chairs up on the tables and there's just david in a spotlight and it sounds just right um, a little, little cheesy just a little bit cheesy yeah yeah just a little, <laughs> little bit cheesy. But it's interesting that David said, uh, you know, because he had tried to do this song before. He, he'd attempted yeah. it with Nile Rogers during the Black Tie White Noise sessions in the early 90s. And then he tried it again during the Earthling sessions in the mid 90s. And both times he said it, it sounded too cheesy. He wanted it to have a kind of arch 
slightly ironic sort of disco sound but but the first attempts were just just sounded ridiculously cheesy disco and they they, they, they kind of the cheesiness overwhelmed the irony of it but the uh yeah the version that you ended i've up never heard the other versions but i would suspect that that just stripping it down to this is what it always needed from the start you know the no right. collaboration yeah. required absolutely no i mean the, the, the those those versions have never seen the light of day and of course it would be fascinating to hear them but as is quite right you know david waited until he had the version he was happy with and, and that's the one that came out and it's yeah a, a great number a great number and uh, and again david sang it throughout the reality tour and it was a it was a huge a huge yeah. showstopper then it, it, it went down a storm and there are some lovely there's a great version on the on the dvd which i believe you did the sound mix for of course and uh, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely superb but yeah after the reality tour of course david at the end of that tour um had some health problems and there began a, a, a very quiet period for him he, he made a few appearances here and there and appeared with ricky gervais on extras and this that and the other but a silence fell for a good few years and up to the point that people began to wonder whether david was ever going to emerge and ever going to record again but uh, just when people were starting to think nah it, that's it it's all over back he came he took us all by surprise on that glorious morning in january 2013 when we all woke up to uh, <laughs> those of us who are david bowie fans woke up to an inbox full of emails going oh my god have you seen this because david who had invented so many things in his career invented the surprise drop onto youtube of the single didn't he i mean no one no one of his stature had ever really done anything like that before it's a standard marketing ploy now oh but, yeah uh, where are we now took the world by surprise <laughs> david bowie melted the internet that day and how glorious it was so you of course knew all about this because you'd been working on it with david for for a couple of years previously this wonderful project the next day was the album where are we now was the opening single and that's the one we thought we'd look at um so when for you did the did the first inklings of that project uh, um start start coming you know when did david get in touch with you um we had been seeing each other during that period we had lunch several times and um, uh, we just chatted and i remember during that period he said i haven't written any I, I didn't ask him he just volunteered this information he said i haven't written a song in ages and i don't really care he, he was quite adamant that he wasn't going to make a comeback but at one such meeting he phoned me up and he says i'm going to make a new album and i said wow you know and uh went and, and and met him met up with him and I, I heard the songs um he uh pl he played it to me and you know we he didn't want to i think he was living he wanted to stay in manhattan he didn't want to go to um upstate anymore Alaire and all that so right around the corner was a great studio that i had been working in called the magic shop Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it was literally a hole in the ground, but what a vibey studio. I mean, it, it had great, great equipment. It was shabby as anything, uh, yeah. but it was walking distance. He could get to the studio uh, in six minutes. I, I think he said once he counted the steps, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, so it was great. It was great. We, we, we kept going in and out and he kept going in and out. He was seen sometimes, you know, there were always Bowie stalkers in the road, but uh, the studio didn't he didn't even have an address written on it or, or it didn't say studio outside and he was seen going in and out of there and once uh, I think uh, Earl Slick was out having a cigarette and they said are you work someone came up to us are you working with David Bowie and he goes no that's all we were just told to say no yeah <clears throat> but uh, but when leading up to the release of that now I, w I was up all morning with him on the on the internet we're like chatting we knew when it was going to drop and we were we were like so excited like young kids and as soon as it dropped we saw the internet explode i mean seconds after it was played on the radio and we just said goodbye to each other we couldn't we just wanted to read all these things which was too much to read and in, 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 <laughs> in, even in that day but yes david bowie was back and he his his single to lead the album off with was a ballad you know yes. any other, any other person would do a make a rock and roll song you know 
that was an amazing, an amazing stroke, a, an, another master stroke because it's a beautiful song. So why not? But but it kind of wrong footed everyone, didn't it? I, I think a lot of people were thinking, oh, this is what David Bowie sounds like now. And so when the album came, you know, shortly afterwards, and it was a, a salvo of well, all sorts of different styles, but certainly kicking off the title track, you know, it doesn't get much heavier than that, does it? And uh, yeah, a brilliant, a brilliant sort of slate of hand i think right but it's such as much as anything else such a beautiful song harking back of course to your time in berlin um and with that wonderful soulful it was henry hay on keyboards with david as well on keyboards i believe but yes, uh, yeah. beautiful piano yeah i'm on i'm on keyboards too and you're on keyboards as well, well we'll be, we, i'm sitting in the very studio now where we recorded the vocals and uh, uh henry came up here a couple of times but then david and i wanted to add some strings the strings i think were added here and david played some i played the left hand and all that and uh, to my left is a vocal booth where david sang the, the vocal and i didn't know until that minute what the song was about he walked in there, there was a typical david bowie album there are no um you don't know what the songs are about because he hadn't written the lyrics yet. He did these, these are just jams. Every, we, this started with the width of a circle, you know, just jams. Yeah. So he goes in there and he, and he goes, had to catch a train, pops down a place. And I look around, I turn around to Coco who was sitting behind me and she, I went, this is about Berlin. And she said, yeah, it's about us when we were all there. Well, oh my God. And I said, before I started to cry my eyes out, you know, I got very emotional that moment. And he, he came in, usually came in, and I said, it was a beautiful vocal. And I said, I can't believe it. It's so beautiful. And he's smiling. I said, you want to go in and do another take? And he said, why? <laughs> so wow. it's take, take one. <laughs> it really is take one. That's amazing. That's, that's, I mean, David was always a fan of take one, wasn't he? If take one was, 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 if he was happy with take one, then why why bother with take two? I mean, and it was always kind of his his attitude, wasn't it? There's you know, well, I, I always had his microphone settings and the reverb he wanted, so I knew it's always best to catch his take 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 one. And I'd have someone go in there and sing and let his laugh because he was really loud. Someone would go in and just sing loud, and I'd get all the compressor settings, everything, and all that. So all he had to do was step in, put on the headphones, and it was there, you know, for him. Yeah, thank yeah. God. <laughs> <laughs> And that that is an extraordinary vocal, isn't it? It's a paragon of of control, and the way that Bowie would serve the needs of a particular song with a particular type of performance. I mean, he was a supreme vocal artist, wasn't he? That you know, the the sort of frailty that he brings to that vocal is exactly what that particular song needs. Elsewhere on the next day album, he's bellowing it out, but on that particular song, that's what it needs. And yeah. I, I I never cease to marvel at how Bowie you know, sort of subsumed his own, he didn't just sing, he, he didn't have just one way of singing. He, he had an infinite, he had a palette that he, that he could draw on for whatever the particular song needed. And he had the power in his voice too. It never went mm. away. Even on, you know, the next album, Black Star, he was singing as well as ever, if not better. And, you know, he might've lost a few top notes, but his baritone was the strongest ever. It was great. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely superb, which brings us on, uh, as, as we should, of course, to, to Black Star, David's final masterpiece. And it, and it really is a masterpiece. Uh, and we, again, we could have chosen any of the tracks on this remarkable album, but uh, we've decided to, to concentrate on the title track itself. It's such a monumental piece. And, and to me, as, as great a piece of music as anything else that he ever did, um, it's long. That's one of the first things to, to notice about it. It's almost like a, a movement from a symphony or something, isn't it? And of course it has all these different moods and different modes. Um, was it always meant to be like that or was it more than one song jammed together? No, yes, it, were, it was meant to be like that. And it took quite a long time to record. It wasn't like so spontaneous like, like other songs. First of all, he was in the best mood ever. He was so thrilled to be working with jazz musicians, to be working with Donnie McCaslin, whom he was already a fan of. David met Donnie maybe a year before and he kept going to his live gigs. I went to a couple of them to see Donnie. That was a dream come true to work with such such a caliber of musician, like the whole band. I'm not saying any of the other musicians were bad, mind you. It was just a different experience he was looking for. And um, uh, 
you know, it was funny thing you say about the length. It was just over 10 minutes. And that's what the Alba ver version is. But we learned from iTunes that they have a 10 minute limit for a single. You can't go over 10 minutes. So we had to shave off some reverb at the end and some bits at the front and all that just to, to get it to get it to be 10, 10 minutes. And it was some vital stuff that uh, I believe that it was. And you, you'll hear it on the, the album version. But the uh, all the parts were there and it, it was done in sections. You know, we it, the band did not play it in one go. They played the first part in one go. And then there's that interlude in the middle where it's all spacey and all that. I would say that's part two. It's a it's a three part of certain. And then the coming out of that into the, you know, something happened on the day he died. That was another so unexpected related to the first part. It's an R and B song. It's freaking R and B, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and to go with like, I don't even know what you would call um the part one is more like an Arabic influence. The the the, yes. the tonality he used was an Arabic scale, and now he's using an R and B scale, a blues scale for the middle part of the song. And then he has a reprise at the end where he sing. He goes back to uh, singing part one the again. So it's of executive, but yeah, four parter, and, yeah. and to, it's a it's a suite. You know, I like to call it a suite. Yeah, like yeah. Rhapsody in blue and all that. Yeah. Uh. And that extraordinary sequence in, in the middle, I don't know if that's part three or whatever, the, the bit where the, the I'm a Black Star bit, where he's doing all the all that kind of wonderful performance in the video where he's kind of being jokey and cocky and doing all this stuff. Yeah. And, and says, I'm, I'm not a film star, I'm a fact that. It, it's, again, just like nothing that any other artist has well, ever or would ever come up with. He sounded like Al Green, you know, this is almost going <laughs> to Young Americans. Where is this yeah from you know what a genius um, absolutely absolutely extraordinary beautiful stuff and yes the the music is just exquisitely beautiful beautifully played by this extraordinary new band that Bowie had pulled together but also beautifully sung by by David when when he gets to the something happened on the way he died it's like it's like the sun coming out it's the most extraordinary it's I I, I think it's as exquisitely beautiful as anything that he ever did um and that goes for the whole album as well it's I, I mean it, it, it you must have been extremely proud, as as I'm sure you were with everything that you did. But when that when that album was finished and and came out, that uh, that must have really felt like a like a good job of work. Yes, we we were it was ready by I would say by October September. So we were living with it. We didn't yeah. we had it mastered. I remember our our lovely engineer Tom Elmhurst who mastered it. Very cocky guy at the time said, "Yeah, I do. A, a, I, I can master it in one day." I said, you haven't heard it yet. <laughs> the conversation we were having up at Electric Ladyland in New York with Tom's headquarters off. And he yeah. came in and he, and he heard Black Star, just the opening track, which I think he had to master three different ways. Like each section he treated differently. It took him a good three weeks to master the album right. because every track was so unique and it had different sounds. The, the low end was extreme and... Uh, Tom mastered it in a way where the mastering sufficed for both the CD and the uh, and vinyl. I thought we'd have to chop off some bait. The low end on that, on that album is fantastic. Uh, we had a new engineer, Kevin Killen, who I, I only trusted him with the responsibility of making such a, a an adventurous album and making it sound really, really cool and all that. So the team we had was amazing and everyone was so devoted to it. and. Kevin told me, you know, we had to sign NDA agreements. Kevin never told his wife he was working with David Bowie till wow. years later. <laughs> wow. Some people took that NDA extremely seriously. Yeah. Well, glad they did. yeah. It's it's you know, much as much as we fans love to hear everything that's going on, the surprise makes it all worthwhile, you know, that's even better. So yeah, yeah, I the the secrecy surrounding these things is you know I, I think it's a gift to us in the end really um yeah there's so no black star um sorry was, there's no real secret he was a happy man making an album he always wanted yeah. to make and everyone was on board and we were all happy that's it there's no secret yeah. yeah yeah absolutely oh no i just meant the you know the confidentiality of the recording process yeah. and and uh, so there but yeah yeah absolutely and it was it was a, a superb album by by any uh, stretch of the imagination the fact that as 
things turned out, it was David Bowie's last piece of work. I, I, to me, it, it feels like a, you know, the crowning achievement on a, on a career that was already uh, unsurpassed. Um, and you know, it's it's one of his great masterpieces. I think it stands right up there with, with everything, uh, you know, anything that he ever did. Um, and we've covered an awful lot of ground from 1967 through to uh, 2016. Um, we've talked about an awful lot of. Uh, an awful lot of wonderful work. Just summing up over your 50 year association with David Bowie, Tony, um, I, I, I don't know how you can, um, you know, whether you can put it in a, in, a, <laughs> in a nutshell, but it's obviously been a very important part of your life. It's been a, a defining part of your, your life and your career, your, your time with David Bowie. Our, our careers are in, intertwined. Obviously, we made loads of albums together. I've made the most David Bowie albums of any producer. And I'll sum it up by saying I turned to him. He was here during Black Star, and I said to him, David, you could work with anybody, and you've used me for the last four albums. I want you to know I'm amazed at that. I'm, it's, it's incredible that you choose to work with me. And, and I just want to thank you. I'm so grateful that you chose me to work with you because I really love what we've done, you know, especially the last four albums, everything we've done. And he had no answer to that. He just sat over my right shoulder here where he always sat and he just smiled, gave me a big grin, wide grin. That's all I need to see or hear back from him. You know, there was, we, there was no words to, we just were, you know, we, we met each other, like, you know, if we want to, you know, spin back to when we met in David Platt's office, we were just two young guys who didn't know anything. You know, we had, ta we had talent and we became great friends. And I didn't see him all the time in the past, you know, 48 years or whatever length it was. But uh, when we came together, we would just pick up the last conversation we had. It was that that kind of a of a close friendship, and you know it would it could withstand being apart for three or four years too. Yeah. So um, that's how I feel about it. You know, I'm very grateful to him. Uh, I I'm I hope I you know you get a lot of criticism. There'll always be criticism, but I get more compliments than criticism for for working with him. You know. Uh, well, I, worked, I, should, I should hope so too. He worked yeah. with great producers and I respect all of them. They've all done a great job and they've all had the benefit of working with the great man, the great one. Yeah. Well, I don't think there can be any any uh, more appropriate note to uh, to draw to a close on. Um, Tony, thank you so much for sharing all of your memories with us. Um, it feels like we've hardly scratched the surface, but uh, on the other hand, we've uh, we've gone on an exciting trip through through a, a really exciting collaboration that's lasted so long, has brought so much pleasure to me and to millions of other people. So thank you very much indeed, uh, Tony Visconti. My pleasure, Nick. Wonderful speaking to you. Hi, Dublin. <laughs> bye bye Dublin <laughs> bye bye Dublin <laughs>